Defending the Earth, A Dialogue Between Murray Bookchin and Dave Foreman, published by South End Press, Boston, Massachusetts, 1991. Chapter 3, Radical Visions and Strategies Linda Davidoff I guess I was sent from central casting to be the mainstream activist in this important discussion. While I agree with Murray and Dave that the ecological crisis is serious, I am not sure I agree with their strategic approaches for making change. For one thing, I believe in the primacy of electoral reform and working within the system. I've been lucky enough to be a participant in the creation of a coalition here in New York called Environment 90. Ours is a platform-building exercise which has emerged this year in response to the mayoral election. We believe that the choices among the major candidates and their platforms would make a difference in how things would go next year in our city. So we've pulled together groups and individuals who are active in fighting for a better environment and are trying to come up with a consensus statement on what we hoped could happen as a result of a change in government. The city of New York has been governed for the last 12 years or more by a school of thought that says the way to deal with our fiscal crisis is to sell, sell, sell whatever's available to the highest bidder in order to bolster the tax base. In the case of New York, what we mostly have to sell, sell, sell is our land and permission to build on it. So groups like mine have been engaged along with other environmental and civic activists in a pitched battle in the administrative agencies, in the courts, in the papers, and on TV. The battle for public opinion is over how high should we build, how dense shall we build, how tall shall we build, how far shall we close down, close in, concretify the city that we all have to live and survive in. Our sense is that these issues matter and that it is worthwhile getting together to try to work out a comprehensive and realistic platform that the citizens of our city will feel comfortable with. Our hope is that we can spark a series of meetings and discussions that will lead to a program for the first hundred days of the new mayoral administration. Murray and Dave probably see this as very tame stuff both of them seem to think that our society indeed our civilization, is rotten to the core and that it is unreformable. Well, frankly I don't believe that our society is rotten to the core. Sure, our society is unjust. Our society is exploitative. Our society is making unwise decisions as an entity. Its institutional parts are not yet fully representative of the public interest and we have to change that. But we live in an enormously stable society one that changes slowly and reluctantly. I don't see a revolution around the corner, eco-anarchist or otherwise. So, I think we better get good at old-fashioned reformism. That's what makes a real difference in the here and now. I remember working against a presidential candidate during the Vietnam era who wanted to bomb the Vietnamese back to the Stone Age. I worked instead for somebody who wasn't ready to go that far. It wasn't much of a choice, but it was the only one we were offered in the electoral arena where key decisions are made, and I think it mattered. It was important to work for the less destructive candidate. Because in the end, those of us who wanted to stop the war short of completely destroying Vietnamese society and culture needed to be effective in putting pressure to bear on the government to limit its destructiveness. And we did that. Indeed, we eventually stopped the war. We eventually convinced people in influential positions in our society to pay attention to our views and to respond favorably. That, I think, is the key to political effectiveness. It is quite possible to work within the institutions that are available to us to make things happen the way we want. The trick is being willing to make effective use of the machinery of government available to us and getting our message across to the general public and government decision makers without alienating them. Talk of revolution, using rotten to the core language, and refusing to take part in elections, political parties, the mass media, the courts, and lobbying all seem counterproductive to me. Let me use a more current and local example. At a recent meeting of the West Side Panel, a city-slash-state development planning body it was announced that the panel had modified its infamous Westway proposal to fill in the Hudson River, bore a tunnel through it, and place high-rise real estate projects on the top along with some parkland as a bone for local environmentalists. The head of the panel announced to the assembled throng, and there were at least a hundred people in the room and lots of media that the panel had decided to forego the option of a landfill. 
A murmur spread through the crowd as people began asking each other how come the option of the landfill was not being pursued anymore as part of the construction that is going on on the west side of Manhattan. That how come is that some local citizens wouldn't give up. They were incredibly persistent, dedicating their lives to struggle against this plan day and night, using the decision-making machinery of the society that was available to them public hearings, the press, and the courts. Here is an example of people intelligently using the institutional apparatus of society to stop a bad thing from happening, the filling in of the Hudson River. Well, it has been stopped and we think we even have a fairly good chance of negotiating with the West Side Panel for the creation of a modest boulevard and a splendid park as part of a Hudson River Greenway that could stand as one of the great monuments to citizen ingenuity and environmental preservation in this society. So I think it is possible to defend the earth through the utilization of the available institutional machinery in our society and a willingness to compromise on some points. We don't reject real estate development outright, just the worst, most destructive aspects of urban development. That doesn't mean that we are never militant. That doesn't mean that we never pose choices in very stark ways. But I think that we have got to assume that this is a stable society that moves slowly and that we can change it if we're very very careful to work out effective, realistic strategies that have some chance of success rather than chasing after utopian dreams. My question for Dave and Murray, then, is why don't you try to work within the system more? Why are you so convinced that our society is rotten to the core? Why do you see your more radical strategies for change as realistic? What is wrong with a pragmatic reformist strategy? Dave Foreman Like everything else I think that we have to defend the earth in a lot of different ways. I am not telling people to do only one thing, to use only one tactic or approach. In one sense, I don't care how people choose to defend the earth, whether they write letters to the editor, recycle newspapers, canvas for an environmental candidate blockade nuclear power plants with a few thousand other people or spike trees and sabotage bulldozers alone in wild areas. I do care, however, that people get off their butts in front of the TV set and do something. You have got to take responsibility for your life and the world. You have got to do something to pay your rent for the privilege of inhabiting this beautiful, blue-green, living earth. If more people would simply get off their butts and do something, we would have a far better chance of survival and defending the earth and its many species. However, I don't think that the goals and strategies that we choose are all equally valuable or effective. Besides getting off our butts, we have got to think hard and figure out what goals and strategies best defend the earth. I certainly have more questions than answers about this, but a few things seem clear to me. For one thing, I think the moderate and so-called pragmatic approach outlined so well by Linda is limited and frequently counterproductive. I would be the last one to say that electoral politics, court challenges, and lobbying for good legislation have no place in the tactics of our movement. I think such tactics can be effective and should not be rejected out of hand. As I said before, I used to work at the Wilderness Society as their lobbying coordinator in Washington, D.C. I was also the New Mexico Chair of Conservationists for Carter in 1976. Even though Jimmy Carter's public lands policies led to the formation of Earth First, he did some good things while in office. That can't be denied. I have also spent many hours negotiating with the U.S. Forest Service and taking part in the public hearings that have been a part of their planning process. Out of this experience, however, I have become convinced that these tactics, by themselves, are simply not effective or practical enough to defend the existing roadless areas that are in such danger today. At a minimum, you would think that the public lands conservation movement would aim, as one of its most important goals, at keeping industrial civilization out of the few wild places that remain. Yet, the mainstream movement has become so loyal a courtier to the dominant industrial order that it cannot even effectively defend this limited goal. You can see the pattern of their current strategy as early as 1956, when conservationists accepted a compromise on the Colorado River Storage Act which cancelled a huge dam on the Green and Yampa Rivers in Dinosaur National Monument by agreeing to one on the Colorado River at Glen Canyon. 
Today the conservation movement's strategy is to bargain away huge portions of the wild world in order to protect a dwindling core of untouchable wilderness areas. This gets us nowhere. Sure, the mainstream conservation movement's efforts at electoral politics, lobbying, and court battles slow the encroachment process down, but they do not ultimately halt it, let alone reverse it. Let's face it, our representative democracy has broken down. Our government primarily represents the big money boys and stacks the deck against reform movements. Playing only by the system's rules limits you. That is why the reformist conservation movement doesn't even think it is realistic to try to defend all of the remaining wilderness in the United States, let alone expand wilderness areas through ecological restoration. Trying to fit in, to not seem radical or extreme, to always seek compromise obviously keeps you pretty damn manageable. It is no wonder that the mainstream conservation movement has been outmaneuvered over the last 15 years because of its timid vision and tactics. For example in the early summer of 1977, the U.S. Forest Service began an 18-month-long inventory and evaluation of the remaining roadless and undeveloped areas in the national forests which are eligible by law for congressional consideration as protected wilderness preserves. All in all, there were some 80 million acres in the national forests retaining a significant degree of natural diversity and wildness. Along with the national parks and monuments, national wildlife refuges, existing wilderness areas and some state lands, these roadless areas represent the remaining wilderness in the United States. These are the places that hold North America together, that contain the genetic information of life, that represent natural sanity in a whirlwind of industrial madness. Now you need to remember that from its very beginning the U.S. Forest Service has viewed the national forests as an arena for industrial logging, grazing, mineral and energy development, road building, and motorized recreation. It should not come as a surprise then, that in January of 1979, the Forest Service announced the following results of its wilderness assessment, out of the 80 million remaining acres of undeveloped lands in the national forests, only 15 million acres were recommended for protection against logging, road building, and other developments. In the Big Tree State of Oregon, for example only 370,000 acres were proposed for wilderness protection out of the remaining 4.5 million acres of roadless, uncut forest lands. Of the areas nationally slated for protection, most areas were too high, too dry, too cold, too steep to offer much in the way of resources to the loggers, miners, and grazers. Those roadless areas with critical old-growth forest values were allocated for the sawmill. Important grizzly bear habitat in the northern Rockies was tossed to the oil industry and the loggers. Off-road vehicle fanatics and the landed gentry of the livestock industry won out in the southwest and Great Basin. Unfortunately the response of the conservation movement was not to call for the preservation of the last remaining wilderness lands in their entirety or to use every legitimate tactic at their disposal to protect these lands and resist government and corporate encroachment on wild public lands. Instead, the conservation movement sought to be realistic and compromise trading most of the wilderness away in exchange for a marginal increase in the amount of proposed acreage to be legally protected. Because of the very limited nature of their goals, these tactics were ultimately effective in achieving this objective, though even this was a big struggle. But it should be remembered that this achievement was hardly a significant victory for wilderness. Furthermore, the Forest Service has since come up with a plan that will effectively block any future conventional efforts at expanding the acreage of protected wilderness in the national forests generally only roadless areas are considered for wilderness protection within the national forests. During the 1980s, the Forest Service developed and began implementing a 15-year plan to get rid of the remaining roadless areas by building over 75,000 miles of new road within the national forests. This immense road network, enough to encircle the planet three times, will cost the American taxpayer over $3 billion to provide large timber corporations access to a mere $500 million worth of timber. More importantly it will cause a considerable decline in the biological integrity of this country's remaining wilderness areas and destroy these areas' ability to support a huge variety of plant and animal species. It would appear that the U.S. Forest Service folks consciously and deliberately sat down and asked themselves, 
how can we keep from being plagued by conservationists and their damned wilderness proposals? Their plans seem to be working out quite well. The Forest Service today is systematically destroying unprotected, roadless areas through a massive road-building campaign. The result is that the effectiveness of conventional political lobbying and electoral work to protect wild lands is evaporating and in half a decade the saw, the bulldozer, and the drill will devastate most of what is now wild but legally unprotected. The battle for wilderness by conventional means will soon be over. Perhaps 3% of the United States will be more or less protected and it will be open season on the rest. Ironically the conventional political tactics that Linda calls our strongest, most pragmatic, most effective weapons for making reforms in the here and now cannot even protect what little natural landscape we have left in this country a very minimal goal from my perspective. This is why I believe that a truly effective, wilderness preservation strategy needs to include a large dose of uncompromising, nonviolent direct action and resistance. I think electoral politics, legislation, those mainstream approaches can still play a crucial part but nonviolent direct action also has to be an important means of defending the wilderness. I say let's approach the problem by looking for the weaknesses in the system, the places where we can throw the wooden shoe in the gears of the machinery, or where we can put the handcuffs on an agency and take power away from them. We need a campaign of resistance whenever and wherever the dying industrial empire tries to invade the remaining wilderness. We need to delay resist and thwart the current system using all the tools available to us. Sure, this includes filing appeals and lawsuits as well as encouraging legislation that ties the hands of corporations and agencies like the U.S. Forest Service. However, to truly get the job done, we will also need to demonstrate engage in mass nonviolent civil disobedience. And, frankly illegally monkey wrench and sabotage wilderness destroying projects. It is now time for women and men, individually, in small groups, and in large public movements to develop a widely dispersed, strategic movement of nonviolent resistance against wilderness destruction all across the land. I believe that such a campaign of resistance can be effective in stopping timber cutting, road building, overgrazing, oil and gas exploration, mining, dam building, power line construction, off road vehicle use trapping ski area development and other forms of destruction of the wilderness as well as cancerous suburban sprawl. I believe such campaigns can be effective because such campaigns hit the rape the land artists where they live, in their pocket books. Many of the projects that are encroaching on roadless wilderness areas are economically marginal. The profit margins on such activities are real but they are very vulnerable to cost overruns. It is very costly for the Forest Service, timber companies, oil companies, mining companies, and others to scratch out the resources in these last wild areas. A broad resistance strategy can make it even more costly perhaps prohibitively expensive. The rising cost of repairs, the hassle, the delay the downtime caused by on-the-ground wilderness resistance activities as well as the loss of public support and the rise of consumer boycotts strikes and other forms of community resistance could protect millions of acres of wilderness far more effectively than any congressional act. Such extreme and uncompromising actions are not pointlessly utopian. They are strategically sound. They are pragmatic. Such tactics do, however require a greater degree of personal involvement and risk than working within normal channels. It takes courage to put your body between the machine and the wilderness, to stand before the chainsaw or the bulldozer or the FBI. More of us need to stand before the mad machine as Valerie Wade did in climbing 80 feet high into an ancient Douglas fir to keep it from being cut down, or as Howie Wolk did in pulling up survey stakes along a proposed gas exploration road in prime elk habitat. Sure. Both of these Earth-first activists put their lives in jeopardy and both went to jail. Yet I am reminded of the famous story about Henry David Thoreau being sent to jail for refusing to pay his poll tax to protest the U.S. war against Mexico. When Ralph Waldo Emerson came to bail him out, Emerson called through an open window and said, Henry what are you doing in there? Thoreau quietly replied, Ralph, what are you doing out there? We need that kind of courage and spirit in our movement today. Conventional efforts at reform are certainly safer and they are, in some ways, better rewarded. 
By staying within normal channels you can usually avoid serious political repression. You are also validated rather than vilified. The effect of this validation, however, is to dampen the effectiveness of a movement. I suspect that it is basic human nature to want to be accepted by the social milieu in which you find yourself. It hurts to be dismissed by the official arbiters of opinion as nuts, terrorists, wackos, or extremists. I think much of the desire to be moderate and pragmatic grows out of the understandable desire to gain credibility or legitimacy with the media and the political and economic leaders currently running our society. The American political system is very effective at co-opting and moderating dissidents by giving them attention and then encouraging them to be reasonable so their ideas will be taken more seriously. Appearing on the evening news, testifying before congressional hearings, or getting a job with some government agency are just some of the methods used by the establishment to entice one to share key assumptions of the dominant worldview and to enter the negotiating room to compromise with madmen who are destroying everything pure and beautiful. Take a look at much of the mainstream conservation movement today. The political vision of most of these reformers includes, at a minimum, a global population of 10 to 12 billion human beings, nation states, multinational corporations, the private automobile and people in business suits on every continent. Such a limited vision is not going to spark or lead a movement for the creation of a wilderness-loving and egalitarian society. Indeed, such a limited vision has little or no future. Modern society is a driverless hot rod without brakes going 90 miles an hour down a dead-end alley with a brick wall at the end. We do not live in a stable society. We're in the most volatile society that has ever existed on this planet. I think the shit is going to hit the fan in my lifetime, that the greed, the insanity, the domination of nature and human beings, this whole madness is going to come to a head. I think that terrible things will happen in the not-so-distant future that will make the current social and ecological crisis seem like the good old days. To seek only realistic reforms, to use only conventional means of social change at this point in time, really means giving up the fight. Reforms that are realistic within the current distribution of institutional power simply cannot take us from here to where we need to be. In many ways, Earth First represents a fundamentalist revival within the wilderness-slash-wildlife preservation movement, a return to basics and a reaction against reformist co-optation and compromise. Over the last several decades, as the conservation movement has grown in prominence, Aldo Leopold's now famous land ethic has been replaced with political pragmatism. It has dramatically limited its political vision. It now views the entire question of wilderness preservation and species diversity as purely a question of pragmatically balancing competing special interest groups and working out compromises between giant economic interests and public recreation enthusiasts. Earth First takes the stand that wilderness preservation is an ethical question, a moral question. It can't be simply reduced to the conventional political currency of self-interest, or even the more humanistic concern for human sustainability. As Ed Abbey frequently said, human beings have a right to be here, but not everywhere, not all at once, not all in the same place. Human society has stepped beyond the bounds, we are destroying the very processes of life. Wilderness is more than puny little backpacking parks in areas with little or no development potential. Wilderness areas are the arena for natural evolution, and must be large enough so natural forces can have free reign. There must be vast areas in every bioregion that are off-limits to human habitation and economic activity. These areas must simply be left alone to carry on the important work of spontaneous natural evolution. This is a radical vision to be sure one which calls many of our social assumptions into question. Yet, any reasonable policy given the level of wilderness destruction to date, requires much more than the containment of the current encroachments of civilization onto existing public wilderness reserves. It is our job, as defenders of the earth, to reclaim much of the now asphalted land, the barren fields, ripped forests, and silent mountains. One of the centerpieces of every ecology group's platform should be to protect or create a big core wilderness preserve in every region. Other wilderness preserves, both large and small, 
should also be established and protected throughout each region as well as wilderness corridors to allow for the free flow of genetic material between them and the wilderness preserves in other bioregions. Of course we will need human management and intervention to help nature restore a suitably large area in each region, at least a million acres to wildness. If certain native animals have been extirpated, they must be reintroduced. If possible grizzly wolf, cougar, jaguar, bison, elk, moose otter, wolverine all must find a home in our public lands again. If salmon streams must be repaired, clear cuts rehabilitated, prairies replanted, roads removed, then that becomes one of the key tasks of ecological restoration. This is a truly revolutionary ecological vision. Any genuinely effective movement to respond to the ecology crisis will require us to mount widespread nonviolent resistance campaigns, including strategic monkey wrenching, to protect as much wilderness as possible from destruction. It will also require us to challenge the government, the corporations, and the people as a whole with an ethical vision of big wilderness. Note. For a full presentation of Foreman's vision of big wilderness, see Dreaming Big Wilderness in Dave Foreman, Confessions of an Echo Warrior, New York, Harmony Books, 1991, 177-192. End note. Yet, frankly even this is not enough. The radical ecology movement also needs to do the important work of organizing the new ecological society that will emerge out of the ashes of the old industrial empire. Some of this work may not even seem radical or revolutionary at first glance, but it is. For example I think the people who are developing cheap and simple low-tech gizmos like solar cookers are doing some of the best work on the planet. These people are saving trees in the third world by decreasing the demand for wood as fuel. I think their work is profoundly revolutionary because it is also saying that big is not necessarily better, that we don't need big corporate slash government techno solutions, and that people can solve some of their problems on their own. We owe much to the alternative technology movement which has been experimenting over many years with composting toilets, organic gardens, handicrafts, recycling, solar collectors, wind generators, and solar cookers. Yet these people like me, are just one piece of the puzzle. If high-tech techno fixes aren't going to get to the root of the problem, low-tech techno fixes aren't going to do the job by themselves either. We must also directly challenge current social institutions on a political and economic level. For instance, we need to make sure that the so-called developed world stops treating third world people and land as mere resources to be exploited. We in the United States clearly have a responsibility to resist the efforts of multinational corporations and first world governments to force third world societies to produce export cash crops for consumption in the first world instead of producing subsistence crops for their own people. This is not just a matter of elemental social justice, it is a key requirement in overcoming the global ecological crisis. Plantation style single crop Export agriculture is far more damaging to the natural world than small-scale diversified, subsistence agriculture for local and regional consumption. This is but one example of how we need to fundamentally reorganize how we make a life on the portion of the planet that we do inhabit. Besides the emergence of Earth first, I think the most encouraging development in North America of late has been the bioregional movement. Bioregionalism is fundamentally concerned with rain habiting the land in decentralized, egalitarian, and ecologically sound ways. It is a concept far removed from the way of life currently common in almost all suburbs, cities, and farms on this continent. Rain habitation stresses creatively adapting human communities to the natural region they inhabit instead of single mindedly adapting the place to an exploitative human society. It means self consciously and respectfully becoming part of the food chain, the water cycle, the environment of a particular natural region, instead of imposing an exclusively human centered, global industrial order on the same area. So while I work very hard to try to prevent the mad thrashing of the dying industrial storm trooper from destroying everything beautiful on this earth, I'm glad there are people like Murray in the Greens, in the bioregional movement in projects like the Green City Program in San Francisco, who are trying to create the new society that will come after us. That's their job. It's as important as my job is. My job is more limited. 
I'm trying to protect as much as possible from the dollar, from destruction in the last days of industrial society. I think Murray and others, in turn, are laying out the concepts and working out the practicalities of a sustainable ecological society that can come after it. In closing, let me just say I very much agree with Murray that this society is rotten to its core. I think it's so fundamentally destructive that it's ultimately unreformable in any conventional sense. I simply can't get from here to where I want to be through the strategic approach outlined by Linda. Indeed, it may not take us far enough to even ensure the continued existence of most of the Earth's species, including human beings. A genuinely radical vision and strategy may not succeed either, but I am convinced that it is the best shot that we have got. Murray Bookshin I couldn't agree with Dave Moore. No doubt there are still real differences between us. Yet, so far as these issues of vision and strategy are concerned, we seem to be in considerable agreement. To begin with, I share Dave's sense of urgency. Capitalist society whether in Western corporate or Eastern bureaucratic forms, is fundamentally destructive. The power of this society to destroy has reached a scale unprecedented in the history of humanity, and this power is being used, almost systematically, to wreak havoc upon the entire world of life and its material bases. In nearly every region, air is being befouled, waterways polluted, soil washed away the land desiccated, and wildlife destroyed. Coastal areas and even the depths of the sea are not immune to widespread pollution. More significantly in the long run, basic biological cycles such as the carbon cycle and nitrogen cycle upon which all living things depend for the maintenance and renewal of life, are being distorted to the point of irreversible damage. The proliferation of nuclear reactors in the United States and throughout the world, some 1,000 by the year 2000 if the powers that be have their way, have exposed countless millions of people and other life forms to some of the most carcinogenic and mutagenic agents known. Some of these terrifying threats, like radioactive wastes, may be with us for hundreds of thousands of years. To these radioactive wastes we also must add long-lived pesticides, lead residues, and thousands of toxic or potentially toxic chemicals in food, water, and air the expansion of cities into vast urban belts with dense concentrations of populations comparable in size to entire nations, the rising din of background noise, the stresses created by congestion, mass living, and mass manipulation, the immense accumulations of garbage, refuse, sewage, and industrial wastes, the congestion of highways and city streets with vehicular traffic, the profligate destruction of non-renewable resources, the scarring of the earth by real estate speculators, mining and lumbering barons, and highway construction bureaucrats. Our lethal insults to the biosphere have wreaked a degree of damage in a single generation that exceeds the damage inflicted by thousands of years of human habitation on this planet. If this tempo of destruction is borne in mind, it is terrifying to speculate about what lies ahead in the generations to come. In the face of such a crisis, efforts for change are inevitable. Ordinary people all over the globe are becoming active in campaigns to eliminate nuclear power plants and weapons, to preserve clean air and water, to limit the use of pesticides and food additives, to reduce vehicular traffic in streets and on highways, to make cities more wholesome physically, to prevent radioactive wastes from seeping into the environment, to guard and expand wilderness areas and domains for wildlife, to defend animal species from human depredation. The single most important question before the ecology movement today however, is whether these efforts will be co-opted and contained within the institutional bounds of reasonable dissent and reformism or whether these efforts will mature into a powerful movement that can create fundamental, indeed revolutionary changes in our society and our way of looking at the world. I have long argued that we delude ourselves if we believe that a life-oriented world can be fully developed or even partially achieved in a profoundly death-oriented society. U.S. society as it is constituted today is riddled with patriarchy and racism and sits astride the entire world, not only as a consumer of its wealth and resources, but as an obstacle to all attempts at self-determination at home and abroad. Its inherent aims are production for the sake of production, the preservation of hierarchy and toil on a world-scale mass manipulation and control by centralized, state institutions. 
This kind of society is inexorably counterposed to a life-oriented world. If the ecology movement does not ultimately direct its main efforts toward a revolution in all areas of life, social as well as natural, political as well as personal, economic as well as cultural, then the movement will gradually degenerate into a safety valve for the established order. Conventional reform efforts, at their best, can only slow down but they cannot arrest the overwhelming momentum toward destruction within our society. At their worst, they lull people into a false sense of security. Our institutional social order plays games with us to foster this passivity. It grants long-delayed, piecemeal, and woefully inadequate reforms to deflect our energies and attention from larger acts of destruction. Such reform measures hide the rotten core of the apple behind an appealing and reassuring artificially dyed red skin. Ultimately however, the key problem with the pragmatic political strategy of trade-offs, compromises, and lesser evil choices is not that it can't take us as far as we want to go. An even more sinister effect of this strategy is that it conditions us to go where we do not want to go. This pragmatic approach has had deadly consequences over the course of recent history. Fascism made its way to power in Germany in part, because the radical labor movement moderated its revolutionary politics and sought to be effective by throwing its weight behind lesser evil candidates. The movement thus surrendered its own initiative and leadership. Such a realistic approach, which seemed so practical at the time, led the German workers from making realistic choices between a moderate left and a tolerant center, to a tolerant center and an authoritarian right, and finally between the authoritarian right and totalitarian fascism. Not only did this moral devolution occur almost inevitably on a parliamentary level, a cruel dialectic of political degeneration and moral decomposition also occurred within the German labor movement itself. That the once militant and well-organized German working class permitted this political drift from one lesser evil to another without any act of direct resistance is perhaps the most dismal event in its history. Environmental movements have not fared much better when they have placed their hopes on the nation-state and lesser evil strategies. To the extent that European environmentalists have entered into national parliaments seeking state power as Greens, they have generally attained little more than public attention for their selfing parliamentary deputies and achieved very little to arrest environmental decay. As Dave so eloquently pointed out, well-meaning environmentalists committed to strategies such as these have bartered away entire forests for token reserves of trees. Vast wilderness areas have been surrendered for relatively small national parks. Huge stretches of coastal wetlands have been exchanged for a few acres of pristine beaches. This is the inevitable result of working within the system when the system is fundamentally anti-ecological, elitist, and stacked against you. The coalition of the German Greens with a social democratic government in the state of Hesse, for example ended in ignominy in the mid-1980s. Not only did the realist wing of the German Green Party taint the movement's finest principles with compromises, it also made the party more bureaucratic, manipulative, and professional. The result? A once grassroots, radical green movement was changed fundamentally and the state it sought to influence did not. The German Greens seem very far today from their early promise of representing a genuinely new ecological politics. Let me make it clear, however, that by counterposing reform environmentalism to the possibility of a truly radical ecology movement, I am not saying that we should desist from opposing the construction of nuclear power plants or highways today and sit back passively to await the coming of an ecological millennium. To the contrary the existing ground must be held on to tenaciously everywhere along the way. We must try to rescue what we still have so that we can at least reconstitute society with the least polluted and least damaged environment possible. To be effective, however, we must break away from conventional reformism and energetically adopt much more powerful nonviolent direct action resistance strategies. Furthermore, we need to go well beyond tinkering with existing institutions, social relations, technologies, and values and begin to fundamentally transform them. This doesn't mean that we don't organize around a minimum program with clear immediate objectives or even that we never participate in local elections. I have argued for such measures in my books and articles on libertarian municipalism. Note. Murray Bookchin, The New Municipal Agenda in the Rise of Urbanization and the Decline of Citizenship, 
San Francisco, Sierra Club Books, 1987, 225-288, Murray Bookshin, Theses on Libertarian Municipalism in the Limits of the City, Montreal, Black Rose 1980, 164-184. End note. It does mean, however, that the immediate goals we seek and the means we use to achieve them should orient us toward the radical fundamental changes that are needed instead of towards co-optation and containment within the existing, hopelessly destructive system. I am convinced that we will fail to keep our political bearings and avoid co-optation unless we develop a bold and uncompromising vision of a truly ecological future. The highest form of realism today can only be attained by looking beyond the given state of affairs to a constructive vision of what should be. It is not good enough to merely look at what could be within the normal institutional limits of today's predatory societies. This will not yield a vision that is either desirable or sufficient. We cannot afford to be content with such inherently compromised programs. Our solutions must be commensurate with the scope of the problem. We need to muster the courage to entertain radical visions which will, at first glance, appear utopian to our cowed and domesticated political imaginations. Today we have a magnificent repertoire of new ideas, plans, technological designs, and working data that can give us a graphic picture of the necessary contours of a sustainable and ecological society. Dave has painted half the picture with his vision of restoring large wilderness areas throughout the continent. But what about those areas that are still to be inhabited by human beings? How can they be organized ecologically? Certainly they cannot remain dominated by sprawling urban areas, massive industrialization, and giant corporate farms run like food factories. Such institutional patterns not only make for destructive social conflict, individual anonymity, and centralized power, they also place an impossible burden on local water resources, the air we breathe, and all the natural features of the areas which they occupy. One of our chief goals must be to radically decentralize our industrialized urban areas into humanly scaled cities and towns artfully tailored to the carrying capacities of the eco-communities in which they are located. We need to transform the current pattern of densely populated urban sprawl into federations of much smaller cities and towns surrounded by small farms that practice diversified, organic agriculture for the local area and are linked to each other by tree belts, pastures and meadows. Enrolling hilly or mountainous country land with sharp gradients should be left covered by timber to prevent erosion, conserve water, and support wildlife. Furthermore, each city and town should contain many vegetable and flower gardens, attractive arbors, park land, and streams and ponds which support fish and aquatic birds. In this way, the countryside would not only constitute the immediate environs of the city but would also directly infuse the city. Relatively close by sizable wilderness areas would safely coexist with human habitats and would be carefully managed to enhance and preserve their evolutionary integrity diversity and stability. By decentralizing our communities, we would also be able to eliminate the present society's horribly destructive addiction to fossil fuels and nuclear energy. One of the fundamental reasons that giant urban areas and industries are unsustainable is because of their inherent dependency on huge quantities of dangerous and non-renewable energy resources. To maintain a large, densely populated city requires immense quantities of coal, petroleum, or nuclear energy. It seems likely that safe and renewable energy sources such as wind, water, and solar power can probably not fully meet the needs of giant urban areas even if careful energy conservation is practiced and automobile use and socially unnecessary production is curtailed. In contrast to coal, oil, and nuclear energy solar, wind, and other alternative energy sources reach us mainly in small packets, as it were. Yet while solar devices, wind turbines, and hydroelectric resources can probably not provide enough electricity to illuminate Manhattan Island today such energy sources, pieced together in an organic energy pattern developed from the potentialities of a particular region, could amply meet the vital needs of small, decentralized cities and towns. As with agriculture, the industrial economy must also be decentralized and its technology radically reworked to creatively utilize local resources in small-scale multi-use facilities with production processes that reduce arduous toil, recycle raw materials, and eliminate pollution and toxic wastes. In this way, 
the relatively self-sufficient community visibly dependent on its environment for its means of life, would likely gain a new respect for the organic interrelationships that sustain it. In the long run, the attempt to approximate local, or at least regional, self-sufficiency would prove more efficient than the wasteful and neocolonial global division of labor that prevails today. Although there would doubtless be many duplications of small manufacturing and craft facilities from community to community the familiarity of each group with its local environment and its ecological roots would make for a more intelligent and loving use of its environment. Such a vision appears quite radical on the face of it. Yet I have to stress that my calls for decentralization and alternative technologies are, by themselves, insufficient to create a humane, ecological society. We should not delude ourselves into the belief that a mere change in demographics, logistics, design, or scale automatically yields a real change in social life or spiritual sensibility. Decentralization and a sophisticated alternative technology can help, of course. The kind of decentralized communities and eco-technologies that I've described here could help open up a new era of direct democracy by providing the free time and social comprehensibility that would make it possible for ordinary people to manage the affairs of society without the mediation of ruling classes, giant bureaucracies, or elitist professional political functionaries. However, a genuine ecological vision ultimately needs to directly answer such nagging questions as who owns what, and who runs what. The answers we give to these questions will have enormous power to shape our future. I would argue that the best form of government in an ecological society would be direct democratic self-government, that the best form of ownership of productive enterprises and resources would be neither corporate nor state but communal at the municipal level, and that the best form of economic management would be community self-management. In such a vision, broad policies and concrete decisions that deal with community life, agriculture, and industrial production would be made, whenever possible by active citizens in face-to-face -face assemblies. Among the many benefits of such a democratic, cooperative commonwealth is the fact that it would help encourage a non-hierarchical, non-domineering sensibility within the human community that would ultimately influence human society's view of its relationship with the rest of the natural world. To be sure, moving from today's capitalist society, based on giant industrial and urban belts, a highly chemical agribusiness, centralized and bureaucratic power, a staggering armaments economy massive pollution, and exploited labor, towards the ecological society that I have only begun to describe here will require a complex and difficult transition strategy. I have no pat formulas for making such a revolution. A few things seem clear, however. A new politics must be created that eschews the snares of co-optation within the system that is destroying social and ecological life. We need a social movement that can effectively resist and ultimately replace the nation-state and corporate capitalism, not one that limits its sights to improving the current system. Direct nonviolent resistance is clearly an important element of this new politics. The marvelous genius of the anti-nuke alliances of the 1970s was that they intuitively sensed the need to break away from the system and form a strong independent opposition. To a large extent, to be sure, they adopted a direct action strategy because earlier attempts to stop nuclear power plants by working within the system had failed. Endless months or years of litigation, hearings, the adoption of local ordinances, petitions, and letter-writing campaigns to Congress people had all essentially failed to stop the construction of new nuclear power plants. Stronger measures were required in order to finally stop new construction. Yet I believe that an even more important feature of direct action is that it forms a decisive step toward recovering the personal power over social life that the centralized, overbearing bureaucracies have usurped from the people. It provides an experiential bridge to a possible future society based on direct grassroots democracy. Similarly community organizing is a key element of a radical new politics, particularly those forms of association where people meet face to face, identify their common problems, and solve them through mutual aid and volunteer community service. Such community organizations encourage social solidarity community self-reliance, an individual initiative. Community gardens, block clubs, land trusts, housing cooperatives, parent-run daycare centers, barter networks, alternative schools, consumer and producer cooperatives, 
community theaters, study groups, neighborhood newspapers, public access television stations, all of these meet immediate and usually neglected community needs. But, they also serve, to greater or lesser degrees, as schools for democratic citizenship. Through participation in such efforts we can become more socially responsible and more skilled at democratically discussing and deciding important social questions. However, and this may shock most conventional anarchists, I also think we need to explore the possibilities of grassroots electoral politics. While it cannot be denied that most ways of participating in the electoral arena only serve to legitimize the nation-state, with its standing bureaucracy and limited citizen involvement, I think it is important and possible for grassroots activists to intervene in local politics and create new kinds of local structures such as ballot initiatives, community assemblies, town meetings, and neighborhood councils that can increasingly take over direct democratic control of municipal governments. The success of such a libertarian municipalist movement will depend on its ability over time to democratize one community after another and establish confederal regional relationships between these local communities. We will need such a geographical, political, and economic base if we are ever to seriously challenge the nation-state and multinational corporations. We will need to create such a dual power in order to wrest important and immediate concessions from the existing system and ultimately to supplant it. I see no other realistic alternative for creating a genuinely ecological society. Such a revolution will obviously not happen all at once in some grand, spontaneous, and violent insurrection. The new politics I advocate has an almost cellular form of growth, a process that involves organic proliferation and differentiation like that of a fetus in a womb. While an ecological revolution will require confrontational struggles, now and in the future, it will also require patient, long-term local community organizing and imaginative grassroots political work. This strategy is what I mean by green politics. The goal here is not simply to represent the growing citizens movement by taking over the existing top-down political apparatus of the municipality let alone the nation-state. The goal is to establish or restore town meetings, neighborhood assemblies, or even neighborhood councils of active citizens as the foundation of local control. Radical ecology candidates should run in local elections on a platform fundamentally oriented toward establishing such citizen assemblies and legally restructuring the governance structure of the city by placing a premium on political participation, face-to-face -face discussion of the public's business, and the complete accountability of citizens who are elected delegates to larger, confederal councils or who serve on purely administrative bodies. These neighborhood assemblies can also be started before they are legally recognized. Indeed, unofficial citizen assemblies could establish a shadow or parallel city council that is made up of elected and recallable delegates from each neighborhood assembly. Such shadow city councils, while legally powerless in their initial phases, could exercise a very effective moral influence on an official city council until they acquire increasing legal power of their own. They could track the agenda and business of the official city councils in close detail, propose needed reforms, and challenge any legislative measures that they find incompatible with the public interest, thereby mobilizing the people into an increasingly effective political force. As direct political democracy is being institutionalized, piecemeal steps can also be taken on many different levels to increase the municipalization of the economy. While not infringing on the proprietary rights of small retail outlets, service establishments, artisan shops, small farms, local manufacturing enterprises, and homeowners, this new kind of municipality could start to purchase larger economic enterprises, particularly those enterprises that are about to be closed and could be managed more efficiently by their own workers than by profit-oriented entrepreneurs or corporations. The use of land trusts as a means not only for providing good public housing but promoting small-scale artisanal production could occupy a high place on the agenda of a municipality's economic program. Cooperatives, community gardens, and farmers' markets could be fostered with municipal funds and placed under growing public oversight, a policy that might very well command greater consumer loyalty than we would expect to find toward profit-oriented corporate enterprises. In such a political and economic context, the ecological restoration of the municipality and the surrounding countryside could begin to take firm root. Public lands could be expanded and restored. 
farmers could be supported to make the transition to diversified, organic forms of agriculture to meet local and regional needs. Corporate farms could be increasingly restricted. Programs could be started to facilitate the reconstruction and repopulation of rural areas by interested city dwellers willing to create new communities of their own. Safe and effective birth control methods could be made available free or at low cost. Recycling could become mandatory. Local business and residential codes could encourage significant energy conservation and promote a switch over to safe and renewable energy sources. The shift to ecologically sound production technologies could begin. Finally we cannot hope to realize this vision in only one neighborhood, town, or city. Ours needs to be a confederal society based on the coordination of all municipalities in a bottom-up system of administration as distinguished from the top-down rule of the nation-state. Be it on a county-wide or regional basis, our new municipalities should be united by confederal councils, each occupied by popularly chosen deputies who are easily recallable by the communities they serve. These confederal bodies should be strictly administrative, they would make no policy decisions but merely coordinate and administer decisions made by the municipal citizens' bodies that select them. Confederation, which has a long though almost lost history of its own, should not be confused with the state, which has always conflicted with confederal structures presumably in the name of efficiency and, very typically, the complexity of our modern society. These claims are sheer hogwash. What troubles me today is that so many radicals accept the claptrap about the complexities of modern society and rarely recognize that when cities have 8, 10, or 12 million residents they are no longer even cities but shapeless disempowered urban blobs that are direly in need of decentralization, physically as well as institutionally. Of course all these ideas about a left libertarian municipal strategy are only the bare outlines of a minimal program for moving towards social and ecological harmony. This strategic approach, however, would help solve a number of immediate problems and point us in the direction of more fundamental social changes. It would begin to build up a popular dual power base from which to effectively challenge the corporations and the nation-state. Successful alliances can likely be built around every element of this minimal program because its goals are rooted in a general human interest that transcends the real but particularistic interests of class, nationality, ethnicity, and gender. Such genuinely populist goals can be formulated in ways that can unite a majority of people, men and women, people of different colors, poor folks, workers in industrial and service industries, and middle-class professionals as well as a few of our elitist opponents who just might have their consciences pricked. I do agree with Linda, however, on one crucial point. It will be an unpardonable failure in political creativity if a green movement that professes to speak for a new ecological politics in this country indulges in a hate America mood or thinks and speaks in a political language that is unrelentingly negative or incomprehensible to the majority of the American people. For decades, radicals have talked to the North American people in the language of German Marxism, Russian Leninism, Chinese Maoism, or, less frequently Spanish anarchism indeed in virtually every language but one that stems from the American revolutionary tradition itself, with its emphasis on community decentralism, individuality and direct democracy in opposition to the concentration of state and corporate power, imperialistic trade, and unbridled greed. We need to consciously revive an older image of the American dream that was communitarian, democratic, and utopian, however defective it was in other respects. While the current system is rotten at its core, it still retains vestiges of earlier, often more libertarian institutions that have been very uncomfortably incorporated into the present ones. Let's build on these institutions and traditions. To use a slogan I've coined in recent years, we must democratize the republic and then radicalize the democracy.